folks, um, everyone who's supposed to be here, and, and I guess we might have a few more trickle in. Um, my name is Caitlin Mogul. I'm a research scientist at the Puget Sound Institute um, at University of Washington, Tacoma. Um, I'll be facilitating this breakout discussion today, along with um, Rachel Mueller, also from PSI. And then we're joined by um, Bob McCain from US EPA, who will be giving a short presentation to kind of stimulate our discussion about watershed modeling and uncertainties. Um, just so you know, we'll be recording this breakout. Um, Rachel, if you wanna go ahead and start that if you're not already. Um, so we'll be recording the breakout and also keeping track of the comments and questions in the chat. Um, also, please feel free to use the raise your hand feature uh, like like folks were doing in the main session. And then, you know, we'll call on you um, to unmute yourself and participate that way if you'd like. Um, just a reminder that we're using this time in the breakout sessions to really jumpstart and frame conversations that will continue with additional workshops that are being planned for this fall where we'll spend additional time on each of the technical uncertainties. Um, so altogether, today's workshops are really meant to initiate collaboration and identify where there are opportunities to move the uncertainty needle, if you will, uh, within the next year using modeling, analysis, and existing monitoring and data. Um, so these are really identifying short-term short goals. Um, here, obviously, we are focused on watershed modeling and uncertainties around that. Um, okay, next slide. Um, so again, this, this breakout is intended to be a continuation of regional discussions on technical uncertainties in modeling of the Salish Sea. Um, we're building on, but hopefully not duplicating, ongoing work like the Puget Sound um, Partnerships Marine Water Quality Implementation Strategy and conversations around the Nutrient Forum. Um, specifically, there are some research needs that were identified in these processes. So um, you can see some of the technical uncertainties that were targeted in previous conversations, um, like the need to advance beyond current watershed regression inputs to understand kind of how factors differ spatially across watersheds, um, what the drivers of watershed nutrient loading, um, nutrient and toxic and other constituent loading is associated, for example, with land use and land cover. And um, also what's the effectiveness of proposed policy and program changes for receiving water bodies. And ultimately to reduce uncertainties associated with watershed scenarios and our level of confidence in the application of different models. Um, I'm sure folks are aware of, of several of the ongoing um, research projects around some that are relevant to some of these uncertainties. Um, one includes a project that's being led by Dustin Bilheimer at the Depart Washington Department of Ecology where they're working to update the Sparrow model to include all of the Puget Sound watersheds and to estimate seasonal nutrient loads. And for that project, um, they're coordinating with local implementation groups and local and state agencies to update data sets on water quality, land use and implementation activity. In addition, there, um, in, in addition to that research action that was proposed in the Marine Water Quality Implementation Strategy, there's also interest in um, coupling numeric watershed, water body, and aquatic food web models. Um, for example, there's interest in connecting um, the Velma watershed model to the Salish Sea model, which it would be the receiving water body and then also coupling that with the Atlantis model, which is an aquatic food web model. And I think Bob's gonna touch more on this idea in his presentation. So now with that background in mind, I'll turn it over to Bob to talk about strategies for reducing uncertainties in modeled urban stormwater runoff and contaminant loads in Puget Sound near shore streams. Take it away, Bob. 
Thanks, Caitlin. Um, how do I access the the slides? Thanks. Okay, yeah, Ra Rachel's um, Rachel's Rachel's your gal. Okay, great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I just want to give credit to uh, all the uh, partners uh, and team members here, and uh, we have really a, a great team. We're looking at uh, strategies for reducing uncertainties. Um, in urban uh, stormwater runoff and contaminant loads. Um, Bob, you are muted again for some reason. Oh, okay. Sorry. Gotcha. No worries. Um, so we've been working in Longfellow Creek watershed um, when we started our work uh, almost two years ago, we were going to model a, a number of contaminants to uh, feed to uh, the Sailor Sea model. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, then, um, next, please. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so a lot of you are probably all, already aware of this longstanding problem um, over the past uh, two or three decades, that stormwater pollution, an unknown contaminant, was killing, still is killing, uh, coho salmon before they can spawn uh, in streams uh, draining to Puget Sound. Next. And then um, in late 2020, uh, a paper was published online by Chen Yu Tian and all. Uh, Hard to see the, the co-authors here, but this is the group that uh, really went after trying to identify the, the smoking gun for what was killing coho at rates of, of uh, between 20 and 90%, depending on the watershed. Um, when they swim upstream from Puget Sound to spawn, and uh, it uh, was something uh, that was clearly very potent. Um, to, to be able to have that effect, coal would die within a couple hours, oftentimes. Next. And uh, so uh, that team identified uh, 6-PPD quinone, uh, which is a, a transformation product of 6-PPD, which is in uh, tire rubber. And so we set out to use the Velma eco-hydrological model. It's an EPA model that we created back in the mid 2000s and uh, modified it to simulate uh, contaminants. Um, I developed the equations for that. I'm a biogeochemist uh, primarily. And uh, Jonathan Halema uh, adapted Velma to uh, urban systems and all the, the various um, sources, sources of uh, uh, green and gray infrastructure, gray infrastructure, especially stormwater pipes and, and such. And uh, next. And so we, <clears throat> we ended up uh, being able to simulate uh, this watershed, um, experiencing high mortality rates of coho. And um, this is, this is uh, north is upside down. So the uh, Longfellow Creek is draining uh, to the north. Uh, there's a sampling site right here uh, that uh, Zhen Yu Tian from uh, the University of, of uh, Washington, Tacoma, uh, Puget Sound Institute collected along with others uh, in Ed Kologi's lab. And um, we, our intent was to try to identify uh, what's controlling 6-PPD uh, quinone, uh, that transformation uh, product of, of 6-PPD, the, the tire uh, preservative, basically, that keeps tires from cracking. Um, so uh, let's see if we can run this. I don't know that there we go. And so this is uh, based on traffic count data, uh, which itself has uncertainty with it. Um, we see uh, daily deposition of um, actually daily additions of 6-PPD quinone from tire wear particles that uh, degrade. And as 6-PPD gets transformed, uh, 
part of the, the protectant capability to uh, byproducts, uh, six PPD quinone uh, is, is generated. And we're watching that here in this Velma simulation. And uh, we, we uh, measured both, uh, I'm sorry, simulated both uh, flow and, uh, next slide please, and um, six PPD concentrations in the, in the stream, uh, compared them to uh, monitored data. And uh, this is the soil side of the story. And um, we're coming to the end of the summer here. You can see the uh, precipitation each day. And um, as it starts to rain again, uh, some of the roadway 6 ppd quinone gets washed in. Next slide, please. So this is a 10 hectare watershed. Um, and urban watersheds are just, um, it's really challenging to, to model them. But having said that, uh, this is a first result. Uh, we didn't try to calibrate the model to fit the observed data shown in, in red. Uh, Zhen Yu uh, did grab samples periodically at the sample site I indicated on the previous slide. Uh, the gray line is Velma's daily um, prediction of how much 6 ppd quinone in nanograms per liter there is. And, um, you know, this is the only five samples we have, um, and we're hoping that more data uh, become available, uh, not just in this watershed, but across the region and in other urban watersheds that we're, we're uh, modeling. But having said that, um, the odds of getting a, a result um, that fits the, the available data so well is just astronomical. Nanograms per liter is the same as parts per trillion. And uh, one part per trillion is, is equivalent to 30 seconds out of the next million years. So um, we think this is more than just luck. Uh, and I'm gonna walk through, next slide, please. The sources of uncertainty, uh, all the things you could do wrong uh, to get a bad answer. And um, so uh, we have practices, uh, you know, established to try to reduce sources of uncertainty in our Velma modeling, uh, no matter where we're modeling. Uh, most of it's been in upland ecosystems, uh, non-urban, um, that are you know, managed and unmanaged, and um, does very well at predicting hydrology and, and nutrient uh, rate and transport. Uh, but contaminants are new, uh, the urban part is new, and so I refer to these four sources of uncertainty as sort of the, the usual suspects. Uh, nothing, new to, nothing new here uh, to most modelers, but I'm gonna walk through what we did uh, to get a, at least an initial uh, promising result. And uh, next slide, please. And so uh, taking the first source of uncertainty, it's the model equations and parameters. Uh, we want to know, does the model adequately represent the processes controlling the outputs of interest? Uh, for example, runoff via natural uh, soil matrix uh, uh, patent transport. And uh, importantly for urban systems, engineered uh, stormwater infrastructure, flow paths, uh, very rapid. And uh, this just displays uh, the calibration we had for uh, Longfellow Creek. Uh, watershed and um, very good fit uh, without getting in, into this. 0.82 is, is really a, a terrific fit to work with and um, a very close uh, annual uh, runoff fraction uh, simulated divided by observed annually is, is uh, almost one. Next slide. And uh, another place that uh, would be easy to, to mess up uh, is the roadway daily additions of 6 ppd quinone at, at those very small uh, rates of deposition, you know, in the range of, uh, it's hard to see here, but um, about on average three uh, times 10 to the minus uh, six grams of 6 ppd quinone uh, per meter squared. Uh, we base this on available information uh, from uh, Tian et al. Uh, 2021, the science paper. And uh, we are just starting to explore uh, what if we pick 
uh, for the law and fellow values somewhere else uh, in this low and high range uh, that they published. Next. And uh, Jonathan Halema uh, did, did an amazing job working with Seattle Public Utilities to assemble their very high resolution uh, descriptions of watersheds uh, throughout Seattle, in this case, uh, Long Fellow Creek watershed, and uh, describing the, the physical features of the watershed in, in this first one. Um, here you can see the, the dash outline. This is the upper watershed flowing toward uh, really areas of higher deposition at the West Seattle Bridge, uh, which we will be modeling next. Um, land cover types, uh, also from the city of Seattle. And um, you know, it's just a break, breakdown here of, of the uh, natural and, and uh, urban uh, systems. Uh, frame C is impervious surfaces. Black is, is completely impervious, uh, very characteristic of urban systems. And uh, this pervious area is a golf course. So there's that involved. The creek flows right uh, past it and through it in some places. And uh, stormwater drains and outlets. This is key uh, because 6BPD is landing on roads, uh, which are set up to funnel water across gravitational gradients uh, to drains and pipes. Uh, many of those pipes have outfalls into the creek. So uh, that's that's really important. Next slide. And uh, so Velma is a, a complex numerical model and uh, many outputs that it, it simulates, uh, approximately 30 uh, hydrologically and, and also biogeochemically. And so we use a, a automated uh, multi-objective evolutionary algorithm, uh, MOIA for short, that optimizes overall model performance for, for multiple outputs. And the point is to uh, reduce the problem of equifinality um, uh, such that uh, the MOIA systematically disqualifies solutions for which calibrated parameters provide the right answers for the wrong reasons. Uh, next. And uh, uh, I don't wanna get in the weeds here, but uh, out of all the possible ways to get the right uh, runoff using Velma parameters, and there aren't too many parameters, about a half dozen, uh, and uh, some of them will give the right answer for the wrong reason. Uh, MOIA eliminates that and ends up with um, this optimization line where uh, runoff, it, uh, a correct answer is constrained by also modeling soil moisture correctly. Next slide. And so um, how do we know if we've reduced uh, uncertainty to the point where we're not propagating uncertainty among submodels? So Velma is a model that links hydrological processes with biogeochemical processes uh, within the watershed at very fine scales. I forgot to mention that we're using a five meter grid. Uh, so grid cells that are five by five meters uh, to model long the ones to our left. So a, a severe performance test to make sure that things are are being uh, corrected uh, correctly represented are to uh, take a calibration from uh, a very data rich site. We've calibrated Velma for forest systems, uh, different example than an urban system, but uh, really a, a good way to illustrate uh, what we're doing. And uh, that's a, a long-term ecological research site at the H.J. Andrews LTER. And we use MOIA and uh, other methods for uh, constraining uh, Velma to predict um, hydrological and biogeochemical processes. And then we just, uh, co different colleagues of ours have applied the, that calibration to other locations. There's 21 coastal watersheds that the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife used to model uh, Velma at very, very high uh, uh, goodness of fit uh, ratios, Nash Sutcliffe ratios. And um, also up in Puget Sound, where we've been applying the model for close to eight years, um, it's worked very well uh, there as well with only minimal uh, modifications to parameters to account for different soil types, especially. Um, one place where it's uh, we're still working on uh, 
the Snohomish has proven very difficult. Um, I think that one reason is that there's uh, deep groundwater uh, influencing flow to, to uh, outlets, uh, USGS gauges, and um, we're still exploring that. Velma is not a, a deep um, aquifer model. It's a near surface, uh, five meters deep is about the best we can get to. Uh, next. And just another example, uh, when we move that um, H.J. Andrews calibration, uh, which is a, a very wet uh, west side uh, Cascade Range, uh, Douglas Fir site, um, huge biomass old growth. Um, uh, we moved it uh, without doing any adjustments to the east side, very dry uh, location, Ponderosa Pine, um, about it. Uh, 10 to, to 20% less precip um, than, than this site. And the model self-adjusted self without any tweaking by us and, and nailed the, the predicted old growth level. Next. And last slide is uh, in closing, uh, if we do our homework here with Velma, as I just walked through, uh, we hope to be able to produce a very accurate, high quality results uh, for nutrients and, and toxic, such as 6-PPD quinone to uh, Terang's Salish Sea model. Um, and of course, Department of Ecology is also using the Salish Sea model. And, and we're really, I've listed uh, the partners here, working also with the University of Washington um, Salish Sea Modeling Center, uh, test is online. Um, that's, uh, we're really looking forward to the next uh, several years where there's a project that's been funded to, to work on this um, uh, multi-model framework. Uh, these won't be the only models. We certainly hope that um, Sparrow and, and uh, DHSVM and other models that are being uh, used uh, can weigh in on this. We believe in model comparisons. We learn from each other. Um, and uh, I, we're just really excited about this. So uh, that's that's it. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, it's really exciting to see the application of Velma to um, you know this important emerging management challenge in the Salish Sea of of kind of understanding the pathways of six PPD. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, Rachel. Um, okay, so the rest of our time here in um, the breakout room is um, for kind of general question and answer for Bob, um, and also just for an open discussion. Um, so first, let's let's open it up to questions specific um, for anything that Bob touched on this morning, um, and then and then we'll move into kind of more of an open discussion. And we have this guiding question that you can see here, which, which you can kind of be thinking about, which is, um, you know, what are the watershed uncertainties that are shared across different modeling efforts? Um, so kind of be, be thinking about that as, as we take a few specific questions um, for Bob on his presentation. And again, feel free to put those in the chat um, and I can moderate them out or, um, or raise your hand. I'm wondering if I could ask a quick question. Yeah, um, go ahead. Bob, thank you so much for your presentation. That was really interesting. I, I'm curious to hear your perspective on what you see as uncertainties that we can resolve in the next year. Yeah, uh, that that's really uh, kind of a key question for what we'll be doing uh, during the next year, uh, Rachel. And um, the... Uh, we, we have a couple of papers describing this work <clears throat> that are, <clears throat> excuse me, going into review. But uh, there's some unfinished business to, to um, focus on uh, the uncertainties, additional uncertainties that, that you uh, are asking about. And uh, some of those, uh, the ones that are included in, in uh, 
one of the papers is uh, testing the uh, addition of, of urban features uh, to Velma. Did we do it correctly? <clears throat> and so we've gotten a lot of insight for a first round of, of testing where we eliminate, uh, if you remember the slide uh, where it describes uh, impervious surfaces and, and uh, stormwater infrastructure and, and so on. Uh, there are four of those that we eliminate individually and then rerun the model. So what, what would, how would the system behave uh, if we took out uh, stormwater infrastructure? So uh, take away the drains and pipes on roads um, or take away the imperviousness uh, of the roadways and make them pervious, uh, such as if you were gonna do uh, pervious uh, streets, um, uh, which uh, different uh, communities and, and places around the world are, are experimenting with. And that was very revealing. Uh, and it has, has a, a major impact on that. So all the things that humans do to, to make urban environments more livable, in other words, without flooding uh, or combined sewer overflows, all that uh, we walk through. And uh, it, it has huge impacts um, without going into that. Um, I think in, in general, though, um, the uncertainties that, that we really need to, to focus on are uh, having to do with uh, those surrounding 6 PPD Q um, quinone. Uh, in this case, and we haven't begun to explore that. So uh, there's still a lot of research going on. And as that research starts to generate more empirical evidence, we'll have a, a better, some better knowledge of, of what exactly it is that we, we should be thinking about. In the meantime, we can play games, um, adjusting the parameters that I showed on one of the slides, and uh, that, that will be very informative. Um, another a uh, thing that we we really need to look at is the biological effects that came up in the in the keynote address. Really, a great summary of, of some of those. And um, the Ed Kologi's lab at the University of Washington is has specifically asked for that. And we it's very easy to set up in in Velma to uh, look at different outfall pipes and how they're influencing uh, concentrations of 6BBQ all, all along the stream. And um, where are they having the hardest, where, where are coho having the, the worst impacts from, from this toxic chemical? And um, some of the stream has been uh, basically uh, renovated to, to help coho, but there's a concern that uh, those renovations, stream renovations, uh, physical habitat uh, attract coho. And if there's an outfall right near those, it could be an ecological trap. So all those kinds of things that are helpful to stormwater managers make decisions about uh, where to remediate. Um, you know, outfall locations can, can be, um, uh, I guess, improved through green or, and gray infrastructure, whether it's a, a stormwater uh, vault to trap those that first flush uh, coming off roads, even in a small rainfall event, uh, could be really helpful. Um, those concentrations get uh, diluted uh, at peak, peak flows. Uh, also putting in uh, uh, bioswales uh, at, at the outfall location can uh, help uh, confine 6 bbdq and hold it in the soil. It, it's very strongly sorbed to soil carbon, and that's a good thing. Um, the the half life is uh, three days uh, maxim, maximum maximum uh, uh, rate of decay, and uh, Velma simulates um, you know how how much improvements you need to make in in soil carbon to really uh, hold back uh, 6 ppd quinone. Uh, from impacting the stream. So there's just a ton of things like that. Uh, now we have a platform we can play those games with and, and we're looking forward to the next year to do that. Awesome. Thanks for the question. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Bob, for your answer. Um, uh, so in the chat, Wendy asked, um, is Velma being used now as an input to the Sailor Sea model, or is it being considered as an input? Well, we have a, a firm plan to do so under uh, a grant that uh, Tessa Francis worked, worked with uh, the granting agency. And um, uh, that that is definitely in the plan. And uh, we're really happy about the, the progress we're making in urban systems uh, because stormwater is the major source of contaminants in Puget Sound. Uh, nutrient wise, we're um, working on, we will be working on uh, expanding our coverage from three major basins up to uh, uh, 18 or so. And um, it's really great to, to see that there will be support for the, the UW to hire uh, two VALMA, uh, basically uh, uh, contributor, contributing uh, scientists, and uh, we'll be helping to train those uh, from the EPA side. And uh, on the EPA side, we also have some grants to, to bring in some postdocs to accelerate the whole process of uh, building toward the goal of, of feeding uh, nutrients and contaminants from the terrestrial side to, to the uh, uh, marine side uh, via the Sailor Sea model. And of course, in that diagram, we showed how the Sailor Sea model is, uh, I think, already starting to uh, uh, parameterize things to, to feed to the Atlantis food web model. So as I said, uh, there will be other models, we hope, uh, from uh, efforts from, from the uh, Department of Ecology and others. Uh, I think that uh, we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket uh, with Velma. And I, I do think that there's a lot to be learned from uh, Sparrow, for example. And, and uh, I hope we can have some back and forth uh, thinking about how uh, each model can benefit from the other. Yeah, great point. Thanks. Um, okay, I see Mary has her hand raised, and then um, Teresa, you'll be next. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, um, thanks so much, Bob. Excellent overview. And I um, love the reference to uh, how this impacts our flooding systems or can impact the water purity across the way. A lot of technologies exist today to sort of be plugged in to do those both monitoring and treatment and catchment. Do you have a um, sort of a directory of the technologies or how do you recommend people go about, you know, finding the solutions that could uh, impact the model, both feeding in data and fulfilling some of those goals you mentioned? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, uh, the timing of your question is really good. Uh, 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 Rhea Smith from the Department of Ecology uh, and, and I have been having an email conversation about uh, next steps uh, during the, the next year and maybe more to see if Velma's approach for identifying contaminant hotspots within the watershed. That's that's really uh, something I should have talked about a little bit more, but uh, we can use Velma to see where the uh, highest levels of contaminants are uh, feeding into the stream. And uh, those hotspots are the places where uh, uh, basically stormwater, uh, community stormwater managers can focus their, their activities for putting in green infrastructure, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And that's uh, potentially uh, less expensive, uh, much less expensive than just using a scattershot approach to putting in um, I love the 12,000 rain garden approach, but um, you know I think that can be enhanced uh, with some information about where the biggest problems are within the watershed. And um, so uh, with Ecology and their stormwater uh, community partners, uh, we hope uh, to be able to test these ideas about treating hotspots uh, to uh, be more efficient for reducing 6-PPD quinone and possibly other contaminants uh, that are hitting the stream. And uh, you know, economically, that's uh, 
probably a more efficient way to, to uh, save, save money. Uh, the Longfellow High Point neighborhood is a good example of a neighborhood that used low impact development. Um, so uh, it's a uh, high up in the watershed and uh, it put in, uh, when it was being redeveloped over the past 15 years, they put in rain gardens and bioswales, uh, pervious pavements to stop uh, contaminants right at their source. And, but to retrofit that for the entire um, West Seattle and uh, Bell Ridge, et cetera, neighborhoods would just be prohibitively expensive. Um, you know, I don't know how many billions of dollars, but so by treating hotspots, um, we think we can help communities save money and uh, really uh, leverage that information to, to be more effective. Uh, Coho don't have much time. There's a great study by uh, Luann Spromberg and Nat Schultz, 2011, uh, that did, did some population modeling studies for coal. And in a place like Longfellow Creek, where uh, pre-spawn mortality for coal is about 90%, um, uh, between 50 and 90%, depending on the year, uh, the time to extinction locally uh, in that stream is as, as low as a decade, um, maybe 30 years. So uh, being, doing things efficiently, uh, efficient remediation uh, is, is really uh, key to saving these, these uh, runs. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Teresa, feel free to unmute yourself. Hi. Thanks, Bob. Great presentation. Um, I am really, I'm new to Velma, and so I'm curious if you could talk just briefly about some of the main assumptions and then beyond the uncertainties that you laid out, what some of the other limitations of the model framework is. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. Um, so it's a main limitation is just learning the model. Um, and any process level model is is uh, not not easy to pick up, uh, even if you're an experienced modeler. So we've we've geared our training. Uh, we we have uh, dozens of of uh, folks that we've trained from different agencies, uh, tribes, um, communities, uh, NGOs, and uh, usually the the people that have the most success with uh, learning Velma and getting over that um, that limitation of being able to apply the model are uh, teams and uh, the, the most uh, the, the teams that learn it most quickly um, have GIS experts, um, someone who's got some modeling experience. The, the hydrology is actually pretty easy to learn, and uh, by the end of a one week uh, workshop, uh, folks are. Uh, playing with doing different management scenarios to affect hydrology. Um, that was a, a effort we started with the uh, Nisqually tribe and their community forest partners. And um, so uh, long story short, um, learning the model is, is uh, not easy, but if, if you have a team with um, complementary skill sets, our own team is, is like that. Um, I'm not a programmer, I'm, I'm not a GIS person, but we have people that do that really well. And uh, we work together in a, in a very uh, uh, complementary skill set mode to, to uh, fill gaps. And um, so uh, basically, uh, you know, it, it's a matter of learning some hydrology, uh, learning some uh, plant soil um, and nutrient cycling principles. Uh, all of that, uh, Velma blends all that together. There's feedbacks hydrologically and biogeochemically to control um, plant soil dynamics, um, stream flow and, and soil moisture, et cetera. And uh, uh, there's a lot of disturbance features built into the model. Um, so just about anything you can think of in terms of um, forest management, agricultural management, um, ur urban stormwater management, you can simulate with this model. There's 
I won't say that's 100%, but uh, we, if we find something that a, a stakeholder needs, uh, we build it in. And um, I don't know, I hope that that's a useful answer, Teresa, did I hit uh, my main points of your question? I think to some extent, I guess the other thing was, I believe I heard you say that the spatial uh, resolution or grain size was about five meters. That, that that's uh, it, it can be anything that the user needs it uh, for. So in the Snohomish Basin, we use a 90 meter grid. Um, these are, uh, much of that basin is, is um, dominated by forests. And so a 30 meter grid tends to work best for um, forest systems, uh, especially if you're interested in riparian management, um, which is so, so important for uh, stream temperature and and stream flow. Uh, but if you were to run a 30 meter grid for you know, an 1800 square mile basin like that, uh, it's doable. Uh, you generate gigabytes of, of data, uh, uh, which is not a problem either. Uh, it just takes time. And um, we are working with Trang to get, uh, we have a contract to use the Hayek supercomputer uh, from the Salish Sea Modeling Center. And uh, there's that potential to really speed things up. Uh, five meters is, is uh, appropriate only for urban systems to capture roadway uh, effects, such as uh, with the contaminant we, we've modeled so far. Um, so it really depends on what, what your questions are uh, and um, uh, adjusting the scale to, to the appropriate level. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Um, I, we might only have a minute left, but are there any last burning questions or comments? How frequently will we be meeting? Um, I think the, the plan is to have kind of a, a more targeted workshop on this topic in the fall. Um, so I don't know when exactly that's going to happen, but, um, you know, you're you're on the listserv now, so you'll hear about that. And uh, it, it may be one of several, but at least one will be focused on on watershed modeling specifically. That's great. Early December is when that one is scheduled for. Um, Early December. Yeah, okay. based on some of the discussions. Awesome, yeah, thanks, Rob. All right, everyone, um, thanks so much uh, again to Bob and for everyone for participating and uh, we'll see you back in the main session for a quick wrap up. Thank thanks you, everybody. And Rachel,